Good morning. Good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you because a few years ago when I was here at the university, I never saw a large group of women from Africa seated in one room like I see you. So coming back at Harvard and then being in a room with so many people from Africa and women for that matter is really exciting. It's different. It's different. So um, on behalf of uh, Argent Action Fund and all of the sponsors who you'll hear from uh, in a little while, I just want to say welcome, Karibu, Vienna mm -hmm. Avenue, to this meeting. It's really exciting for us to be able to look at the leadership of women from the perspective of the continent of Africa and to do it at this <coughs> prestigious university that has produced many leaders that are present everywhere in the world. And we are part right now of that stream of leaders because we sit here deliberating on the same things that they have deliberated before on. And I believe that the two days that we'll spend here will not only give us opportunities to explore what 2015 and beyond brings to us, but actually the dreams that we'll be able to share the dreams and the collaborations that we could be able to put together to really make a difference. I'm the CEO of the Global Fund for Women, and what we care for is that there is funding that makes women's dreams, women's actions um, really be implemented. So part of what I care for is that the things that governments and institutions of learning and um, everyone else says that there's money behind it. So I always ask, where is the money for it? So I hope that as we dream, we'll also continue to say, and where is the funding for that issue going to come from? And secondly, it's really important that when we speak about funding, that we link the outcomes. Because money alone invested badly doesn't make sense. In fact, it makes people discouraged. Money invested in wrong things does not bring us the kind of uh, outcomes that we want. So we're going to be saying this is the outcome that we want. We want such kinds of investments in those outcomes, and we're going to be responsible for the accountability of both the outcome and the investment that we look at. I hope that we will be able to get to that. And with that little introduction from where I come and the reason why I think that meetings such as these are important, I would like to welcome our host in this place where we are at Harvard to, um, um, uh, to welcome us, actually. So I would like to welcome Mindy Roseman, who is the academic dean of the Human Rights Program at Harvard School. And we have a CV for her inside the, the agenda. So please do take note of it and take a, um, so that you could know who's Mindy, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to stand up over here. Dear esteemed guests and colleagues, all protocol observed. Et pour mes consoeurs et frères francophones, je m'excuse de parler en anglais. One uh, item that I think is very important is the washrooms are downstairs all the way. So just keep going around the staircase and you will find them. It is with great personal pleasure as well as on behalf of the Human Rights Program that I welcome you to Harvard Law School for this two-day meeting to discuss the role of African women in the post-2015 development agenda and Beijing Plus 20. The Human Rights Program finds itself in rare company with the Urgent Action Fund Africa Women's Rights Program and the Ford Foundation in working together con to contribute to this meeting's realization. Thanks are also due to OSI South Africa and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Government of Netherlands. We are all grateful that you could make the journey here and that with fingers crossed, our epic winter weather will not impede your journey to New York. <laughs> Especially thanks are due to Rangita Da Silva for making the initial connection and Donna Bo Bofu Twamba, Twamamba for her focus and initiative and all of the Urgent Action Fund Africa staff. As these next two days are full of substantive examination of the ongoing challenges facing women, men, communities, societies, economies, politics, peace, justice, and rights in Africa, 
peppered with a few spirited breaks, I will keep my remarks brief, but I would be remiss not to share with you some pertinent observations. First, I would like to remark on the setting for this meeting at Harvard University, the law school, and in general in this grand room, the Ames courtroom. This room was originally the library for the law school. It is now the venue for our famous moot court, an exercise for law students to practice their metier and argue a fictitious but ripped from the headlines case before leading federal judges and by tradition, a US Supreme Court justice. Who sits right there? This past year, <laughs> Justice Antonin Scalia presided, the year before, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This room is also a regular site for larger events. A few months ago, Edward Snowden was beamed in from Russia to be interviewed by Harvard Law School professor Lawrence Lessig, and many of the events convened in the wake of recent racial and police violence in the US have taken place here. In sum, it is both a daunting and inspiring to gather and launch these proceedings from the Ames courtroom. It is a particularly fitting and auspicious setting. Second, Harvard University, the law school, and the human rights program have deep and evolving ties and commitments to the many diverse countries and women, men, and children of Africa. The Center for African Studies at Harvard University dates back to 1969 and counts over 500 faculty members from across the university who conduct research and teach on topics related to Africa. More than 400 courses are taught on African-related themes and topics, and more than 80 fellows from Africa play an integral role through their research and teaching across the university. Harvard now boasts the world's foremost African language program with 39 African languages offered. The university also has over 300 partnerships with nearly as many different institutions and organizations across Africa. And more than 200 Harvard students travel to Africa each summer to conduct research and work with NGOs on issues spanning the sciences, social sciences, law, and humanities. Dozens of Harvard Law students with financial support through the school and programs such as my own, the Human Rights Program, take up internships each summer with African organizations working across a range of human rights issues, women equality, gender-based violence, access to health services, and so on. I and a number of my colleagues who teach in the Human Rights Program and across the law school are proud to count ourselves among the members of the Center for African Studies. Harvard Law School, you may also know from your own personal experiences or from films like Legally Blonde or The Paper Chase. All reasonably accurate portrayals, I think of, but life is actually stranger than Hollywood fiction. While there's so much I could share with you about the students, faculty, staff, and alumni, their diversity and excellence with students from over 1,500, um, we have students, of, over 1,500 students, whether JDs, LLMs, they come from every state and over 70 countries. Faculty who research, write, and teach across a vast range of topics. They advise governments and private enterprise, some of whose faculty and alums have become Supreme Court justices, as well as prime ministers and presidents. I really just want to give a shout out to a number of student groups who have shown early and continual interest in this meeting the Harvard African Law Association, the Law and Development Society, known as LIDS, and the Women's Law Association, the WLA. Hopefully you will be able to meet and interact with these students throughout these coming days. The WLA and LIDS are also responsible for supplementing the gallery of tenured faculty portraits with those portraits of insp inspirational women lawyers and policymakers from around the world in honor of International Women's Day. They hang in the Wasserstein Hall building where this afternoon and tomorrow's proceedings will convene. So do take a look. The Human Rights Program just celebrated its 30th year and was founded in 1984 as a center for human rights scholarship. It later expanded to include an international human rights clinic. Today our faculty and staff include scholars and practitioners with decades of experience in the field. Seven members of our team teach at the law school and equal numbers supervise clinical projects each year. As part of the broader human rights community at Harvard, we work closely with other faculty, numerous graduate students, and research centers, such as the Center for African Studies at the law school and university. And we're also fortunate to host a group of visiting fellows each year who enhance our community with their research and practical experience. HRP's ties and indebtedness to African human rights luminaries are numerous. 
Macau Matua, Dean at SUNY Buffalo New York Law School, and something of a gadfly to the Kenyan government, was one of the founding assistant directors of HRP. Benai Naroji, former head of OSISA ES, um, no, OSI East Africa, now heads OSF Asia. She's an LLM graduate of HLS and one of our dearest colleagues. She was a co-teacher in the first clinical seminar on international human rights, a course that has been expanded and improved upon over these years, and owes a great debt to her. When I joined the human rights program about 10 years ago, Kari Betty Murungi, a former director and co-founder of Urgent Af Action Fund Africa, was a visiting fellow for us for that year, supported by the Ford Foundation, I believe. Other recent vi visiting fellows from Africa include Christoph Haynes and R Rashida Manju, both currently UN Special Rapporteurs addressing extrajudicial killings and violence against women, respectively, Burkutan Mcdesa, an Ethiopian judge, and Hawa Ibrahim, an attorney from Nigeria who defended Amina Lawal, were also visiting fellows. In terms of African connections at HRP this moment, one of our current fellows, Fergal Gaynor, recently was a lawyer representing victims of the post-presidential election violence in Kenya before the ICC. In addition to the summer internships, the International Human Rights Clinic offers many experiential learning opportunities for students to work under the supervision of our faculty with local partners on their human rights priorities in Africa. The clinic's co-directors, Susan Farbstein and Tylene Giannini, for example, are involved in a number of clinical projects in South Africa with South African partners. One concerns major corporate alien tort statute suit in Ray South Africa apartheid litigation, currently pending before courts in New York against Ford Motor Company, not the foundation, <laughs> and IBM for the support and assistance they provided to the South African apartheid government to commit human rights violations. Another project with the Equal Education Law Center concerns multiple litigation and advocacy projects to promote and protect the right to education. Bonnie Dougherty, another one of our clinicians, has an ongoing project relating to gold mining operations in South Africa. I myself have partnered with the Namibian Women's Health Network to assist in documenting a range of human rights violations that women living with HIV face in public health facilities in order to contextualize the practices of forced and coerced sterilization. I've also worked with the International Center for Transitional Justice in the DRC and many local women's groups and NGOs in Goma on human rights remedies and reparations matters related to reproductive health and gender-based and sexual violence. Enough about Harvard and HRP, now about you. I do want to underscore the importance of these sessions, discussions, and exchanges that will take place over the next two days regarding the role of women in general and African women in particular in the post-2015 global agenda. Last week, the pre-sessional negotiations over the political declaration on the anniversary of Beijing Plus 20, which will be adopted today at the Commission on the Status of Women meetings in New York that I know you will be attending, they were not going well last week. Russia, Indonesia, the African group, and the Holy See were constantly trying to limit references to the human rights of women and girls. The same countries were calling for the deletion of references to the role of feminist groups in advancing gender equality and women's human rights. CARICOM also introduced impediments. They, along with others, have also worked to water down the language and strip any meaningful commitments from it so that on the 20th anniversary of Beijing, women are left with a declaration that says very little about the magnitude of the challenges we still face in achieving gender equality and the full realization of our human rights. The political declaration is less than what it might have been. African women can speak powerfully as individuals and collectively to their governments to ensure that this statement is not the final word. As we focus on the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals and their rollout, you, who are your government's direct constituents, if not its representatives and participants, in tandem with allies around the globe, can press for better so that the post-Beijing MDG SDG outcome documents include, at a minimum, a set of demands, targets, and goals across the entire range of issues to achieve the full realization of women's human rights, as well as funding. In other venues, African institutions are leaders in articulating women's rights norms. For example, in the areas of sexual and reproductive health, 
Here, I am referring to the recently issued general comment on the right to health of the Maputo Protocol. This document is a beacon for advocates, no matter where they are situated, and evidence of Africa's leadership on vexatious issues. The influence of Africa at the UN can be profound and global, and the documents that get negotiated and agreed to during this year will establish a blueprint for development and human rights for the next 20. Do not underestimate your formidable power to answer those governments which conjure up notions of tradition and culture to deny us equality in our dignity and rights. We look to you, stand with you, and wish you much strength and success. So in conclusion, we welcome you to Harvard and hope that you find the setting commodious, inspiring, and not too cold, although perhaps the weather will keep you inside and focused on the sessions. I ask for your forgiveness and my sparse attendance as I teach today and tomorrow, but I'll be around as my schedule permits. And Gabby Follett is over there, HRP's program assistant, who really deserves a commendation for all her organizational efforts, will be around should you find yourselves in need of something. She'll also be in and out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Rosman. That's really good for you. Last week was hard for us, and I'm glad that you put it on the table. It was hard for us, especially those of us from Africa, seeing our own governments pull back on a, on a language that we care for, especially those of us that work from the human rights framework. And so we have work to do, and we have work to do next, next week, and we have work to do in our countries. And um, um, I'm delighted and honored to uh, welcome our leader, for this workshop, for this particular time here, uh, Madam <laughs> Dana, who everyone I think who is here knows, and she's worked tirelessly together with her team to get us here and to get us organized to be here. And she's going to frame for us um, the reason that we are here and the work that is ahead of us. Before she comes, I just want to say that um, I have observed the work that, that uh, uh, Tawamba has done over the years, and she is a fearless leader. She opens places that are closed. And uh, <laughs> her leadership of urgent action to get into this space where we can be able to, to speak about women's leadership instead of only waiting to react to things that have happened to us is really very key. And I just wanted to be able to affirm that as I welcome Tawamba, please. Yes. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, Ms. Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Our visionaries, our elders, our feminist ancestors from across the world who established resilient social movements are in this room today, rejoicing and proud of the work they pioneered. These leaders fought with wise and timeless words, with transformative ideas, and with rebellious visions of a more peaceful, more inclusive, and more just future. They dared to dream, and indeed, they dreamt bold dreams. They refused to accept the future as predetermined, as fundamentally unequal. I want to pay tribute to them today. They include Rosa Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, Mbuya Nehanda of Zimbabwe, Wangari Mathai of Kenya, many others who refuse to be bowed. You are all here because you refuse to be bowed. We are fueled by the same fire as our ancestors. We dream their dreams. Today, the future is in our hands. It is ours to shape. We have the power to dismantle the structures and systems of patriarchy to dream even bolder dreams. My sisters and brothers, welcome, and belated happy International Women's Day. <laughs> Urgent Action Fund Africa and her partners relay heartfelt gratitude to each of you 
for honoring our invitations and attending this historic gathering that is connecting platforms for intergenerational and cross-sector leadership. You have the vision, knowledge, experience, and spirit to uplift and nurture a new cadre of African women leaders for action. Let me take this opportunity to appreciate the warm welcome we have received from the Human Rights Program here at Harvard Law School, represented by Professor Mindy Roseman. We are grateful for the opportunity afforded us to host this timely gathering on this prestigious campus. We see this as a beginning of a fulfilling relationship between our organizations. Many thanks also go to our cooperating partners, Ford Foundation, the Dutch government, and OSISA. It is a tremendous honor that I'm standing here talking about a topic that is prioritized by Agent Action Fund Africa. Leadership is critical to the activist work of women on the continent. At UAF Africa, we have a conviction that leadership is about learning how to shape the future collectively. We have been motivated to strengthen our collaboration with social justice practitioners, academics, artists, politicians, scholars, corporate executives, journalists, and activists, some of whom are here at this gathering for three reasons. First, we are inspired by the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. In this room, I'm proud to say we have convened luminaries and visionaries, artists, leaders and thinkers who have all in their own ways shaped our world and by some measure the work of UAF Africa. We have scaled leadership heights as a movement and not by ourselves. We are breaking down silos between the worlds of activists, technocrats, academics, and corporate sector leadership to build a stronger and more resilient transnational feminist movement that learns from one another. Second, we are motivated by the immense agency we are witnessing on the ground where women are transforming societies. We are here to augment that narrative and enhance the political consciousness that women are leaders today, have been leaders yesterday, and we will lead boldly in pursuing peace, security, prosperity, and justice for their nations. Let, ne let us never give away the right to control this narrative. We are here to claim our space and rights while telling our own story, generating our own knowledge, as we committed to doing in the Beijing Platform for Action. Third, Africa is experiencing fundamental, structural, sociopolitical, and economic renaissance, which others have coined the African moment. We are exhilarated at the change this moment is bringing to the continent and her citizens. At the backdrop of this excitement are critical issues that participants in this gathering and beyond will need to interrogate and robustly engage inter alia issues of security, poverty alleviation, equal participation in decision making, access to quality health care and education, as well as economic justice. Colleagues, let me take this opportunity to affirm that this gathering provides a rare and unique opportunity outside of the everyday rhythms of the leadership work we do to envision, strategize, and plan for a different future. We are here to fracture the status quo, reflect and to renew our energies and spirit into catalyzing new political and economic discourses for our Africa. This think space serves as a nexus for conversation, knowledge sharing, and inspiration, thereby 
sparking an unimaginable wealth of information, spirit of political uprising on how to bring about social change in non-conventional ways. We are here, sisters and brothers, to do business unusual. Appreciating the power that is obtaining in this room through the diverse leadership that each one of you represents, I'm reminded that our power and strength is in our numbers, in our collective capacity to change the paradigm of power. At Beijing, women refuse to accept anything less than equal. Our leaders, many of us who are here today, declared women's rights as inalienable, integral, and indivisible part of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. 20 years on, our job remains to nurture this core foundation of humanity, to see the Beijing vision accomplished. But 20 years on, the work needs more stocking of the fire. So we forge ahead together. Last but certainly not least, I'm encouraging all of us to embody fresh ways of being, seeing, thinking, and acting in order to plant and ultimately harvest transformational change in attaining collective rights for all. Collective rights for all and collective rights for all. Asante Nisana, thank you. We have an agenda card for us. Business unusual. <laughs> it's a big agenda. Envision, strategize, plan uh, what we've been asked to do. And we are doing it in a place, symbolically, where so much has taken place, as we were told by uh, the professor in the beginning. We are in this space where that can happen. And so with that, I'm delighted to uh, welcome a friend and a colleague, Margaret. Margaret and I knew each other a lot more than I know her now when we <laughs> both worked in the same sector, as she worked for the Ford Foundation and I worked for the Packard Foundation, working for foundations, both of us. And we've sustained that. One thing I know about her is that she really cares for human rights. I, and by the way, I am not reading the biographies of everyone in there because they are in there. And the feminist agenda has told me, please don't ever do that. Because <laughs> we go to these meetings where you have the agenda and you have, and everybody reads through this exactly the same. So I hope that you are realizing that I honor these speakers and you have their biographies. And I'm just able to say one or little thing that I know about them. So Margaret, thank you so much. And as she comes in, I just want to emphasize the role of funders and foundations. Ford Foundation or CISA, in terms of foundations that have funded human, human rights over the years and really recognized the women's rights, really go down in history to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And you embody that, those of you that have come from there. And the Dutch government right now is the leader government that funds the issues we care for. Mm -hmm. And I just want to recognize that and, um, and um, all of the other funders that they are really the role of funders in the realization of our agenda is very important. So thank you, Margaret. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, my friend. And um, I'm not multitasking. We always say that women do three things at once. Um, I'm just keeping track of my time. <laughs> so, um, so it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be able to be here today. Um, I'm representing the Ford Foundation and really representing extraordinary work that uh, colleagues of mine um, get to do in the different countries where the Ford Foundation works, including Rosemary, who's here now, and Monica and Susan, who'll be joining us. Um, and I really, I was thinking as I was preparing some comments coming up here that I couldn't be more delighted to be in this room on the day after International Women's Day. And then I had a pause and I thought, there is something very frustrating about having a day I know it's important, I know we need to pause and celebrate, but it does make me worry that the other 364 days of the year, the work that all of you do, and we do day in, day out, is not recognized, and that the world pauses for 24 hours, Amazon, the online shopping, sends me a happy International Women's Day, it's time to shop, 
Um, and I feel like we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so I also really hope that someday on International Women's Day, we're not sending emails and organizing and staying up late writing papers, still trying to make real the statement that happened in Beijing that women's rights are human rights. I also hope that someday we are not doing the research, advocating to convince people that, and having to rationalize that investing in women and girls is important because if you invest in our work in our agency, we will bring world peace, we'll save the environment, we'll save your government, we'll improve your economy, um, you know, you name it. But my dream is actually that someday we will wake up on International Women's Day and we won't have to make those arguments. That we will be investing in women and girls because it's important in its own right. Um, we know that there are all kinds of amazing benefits that then flow from that and women and girls are important in their own right. And that was kind of one of my core reflections and I think as we move into these big international processes, we have to make the instrumental arguments at time to get the seat at the table, to get the language in, to get the commitments, and we can't lose sight of the right and voice component in it. So I would say I was asked to speak a little bit on some of Ford's um, lessons, and I think that's really one of them, is how do we hold both of those. So um, just quickly, I was asked just to comment a little bit on um, Ford's, what we've learned as an institution in the last 20 years since the Beijing conference. Um, just very quickly for people who don't know the Ford Foundation, we are an international institution, a funder, so we provide grants and learning opportunities for organizations in many countries around the world. We work in 11 countries. Unlike many um, US-based institutions that work internationally, um, we actually consider the United States a country, so we also fund in the United States. Um, and then have offices and staff working um, of relevance to this conversation out of uh, an office in South Africa, in Kenya, Egypt, and Nigeria. Um, we are not part of the Ford Motor Company. Um, just, um, so I would say the other second really important lesson that we've learned um, over and over again is the importance of being able to provide support directly to groups who are doing the advocacy, the training, the leadership in the countries where we're able to work. Um, that that kind of voice up is critical in the countries, but absolutely imperative in terms of shaping some of these global processes. Um, as we look globally, we're very concerned about how these processes roll out. I would say one of our lessons learned is in the multiple places where we can be, figuring out where are the teeth kind of what are the pieces that we're going to be able to use afterwards back at home in our own countries to actually hold the institutions accountable to the agree agreements. Um, related to how we're able to fund and your comment just about where is the money, that um, having the input on the front, getting the recognition, getting the targets, getting the names, getting you know, everything that we want in it is just the first step. And I think we, um, as funders, made a mistake after all of the big conferences in the 1990s where there was a lot of upfront investment and then not follow on investment. And so we didn't hold true to our part of the bargain in terms of really helping on the implementation afterwards. I think that's a very serious and important lesson for donors. Um, I think, and I'm just gonna skip through because I've got a gazillion lessons, you know, wish I knew them then. Um, I would say one thing that we have to be careful about, isolating contentious issues. Um, for example, it's um, very frequently, we have issues around sexuality, around reproductive health, kind of like, well, maybe if we take that off the table, then we'll get this other agreement through. Um, we know that these are important for women to be able to exercise their full voice, and we also know that they are often used as the wedge issue to then undermine a much broader array of issues that matter for women and men in our countries. So, um, I would say one of the other lessons that we've learned is really focusing on the question of systems change and thinking big. Um, I would say 20 years ago, Ford and other donors, women, kind of, you couldn't say women without micro. Um, small, grounded projects are critical. Many of us actually got a foothold into wherever we are now through a program or something that reached us in our local community or in our school. 
um, but that's not enough. We, we're macro. We need to be not just in the women's sectors, but in every other place. When we're debating environment, when we're debating the economy, when we're looking at new democracies. So again, I think that really has shaped how Ford thinks about this. Um, some of the other pieces that we're really thinking a lot about now is how to support um, democracies are in a fragile state um, at, in the United States. <laughs> I'll start here. Um, but many places around the world, the promise of democracy is not yet fulfilled. And we fully believe that part of that has been there has not been enough investment in ensuring that the structures of democracy have the full participation of women and of men who understand the importance of designing policies and programs and budget streams that will actually support people through all different parts of the society. So this is something we're really looking at, is what does it mean to build democracies and hold women's agency and gender equity together? And how do you get professionals in government who can do that? How do we make sure that financial streams do this? Um, and I would say on the democracy, democracy side, we absolutely understand that the, the, the mirror to the democratic institutions is the democratic voice of people. So we continue to invest and feel very strongly that movements and different kinds of civil society associations are critical um, and that democracies will not survive and be strengthened if we do not have the independent voices of advocates. Um, on the grounds and in these different spaces, both pushing for what these we need these countries our systems need to look like, and also what um, holding people accountable to the agreements that are made, whether they're made in Geneva, New York, the capital city. Um, and finally, on the movements question, I think we are really thinking a lot about what the question around young women leaders. Um, one of my biggest lessons learned was actually in Beijing when someone was talking about young women being the future. And a woman stood up and said, if I am only your future, you have just made me invisible now. And I think really thinking about young women are leaders today. They are part of our institutions. They're part of our movements. And I think we need to invest in that and think about how do our institutions, our movements, support that agency. And really, one of the things that Ford is thinking a lot about is what does intergenerational work look like in a meaningful way. Um, finally, I would be, um, I was so excited to see how much focus there is in this conversation around questions around communication. Because I think as you said earlier, this isn't just about our policies, our laws, and our practices. It really is about who shapes the narrative. How do we start to shift cultural norms so that women and men can express themselves fully and freely? And these are the aspirations that we have. And I hope some of it rings true to you because, frankly, we've learned it from getting to work alongside of all of you in the room and other colleagues who aren't here. So thank you. Thank you so much for that inspiration. Are there any representatives of OSISA here that I'd like to acknowledge you, if you're here? Just by your hand up. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you so much. I just wanted to acknowledge that you are here as well. Any representatives of the Dutch government here? No? OK. Any other sponsor here? The, yes. The Romana? We do have. Um, yes. I want to acknowledge you. Thank you again for, for being our sponsors here. Yeah. And it's my delight to welcome our ambassador of the African Union. One of uh, our success that was quoted by the professor in the beginning is that we have actually passed some uh, protocols that are so good that if we actually implemented them, we would be a model to the world. And um, we often uh, wonder how to push the African Union to do, continue doing the right thing and actually um, part of uh, what we hope that uh, our ambassador will do for us today in all of her remarks. I hope that we can really work with you for these two days to understand how we can um, continue to uh, lobby the African Union 
to be a leader for us on these issues because there are some really good protocols that have come from the union. Ambassador uh, Amina lives in Washington, D.C. That's one thing that I have learned. She's uh, from Tanzania, representing the whole continent as ambassador for us uh, of the African Union here. Welcome, Ambassador Amina. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to express my profound appreciation and uh, gratitude for being able this, to get this opportunity to participate in this meeting today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Dana, the CEO of uh, UA Africa, UAF Africa, and your entire team. This is, for me, a, a very good opportunity to be able to spend some time with my sisters and brothers within these two days. I would also like to convey the greeting from my chairperson. I'm saying this because she is the first woman chairperson for the African Union for the last 50 years. It's the first time that we have a woman representing us in the commission, and we are very proud of her. And because, because of her leadership, we are seeing the touch of a woman in decision-making process within the commission. And we are seeing a lot of uh, success because of her initiative, because of her commitment to really make the difference for women in Africa. And uh, she really has uh, one thing that she always said, and I really want to caught her here today. She always said that uh, statistically we represent over 50% of uh, people in Africa. But at the same time, we also reproduce the other part of the 50%, the other part of uh, people in Africa. So this is, she sees the important role of women in African development. Today we are here because our organization have called us together. Fortunately, it coincides with activities going on all over in New York and other parts of the world. But for me, this meeting is very, very important for me because 2015 is an important year. It's a landmark year for African women. And I'm saying this because of three reasons. The first reason because we just had African Union Summit in January, January, February in Addis Ababa, and I participated in that meeting. And during that meeting, the heads of state adopted two things that are very, very important for us in Africa. The first one was the adoption of 2063 agenda, and I, I will come and discuss this later on. This is my, 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 my theme today, my topic I was asked to present, the role of African women in implementing the agenda 2063. But the second uh, important uh, uh, declaration that was adopted in, during the summit was the declaration to, to declare 2015 as a year for empowerment of African women. <coughs> and normally when we select a theme, that means theme normally takes two years for implementation and advocacy and other things. But at the same time, the same year, 2015, African Union, we are participating in finalizing the post-2015 agenda. And I'm sure in your meetings in UN, I'm sure you, you are discussing this, the future of uh, development in the world. And we were asked as African to come out with a new position so that we can negotiate with other continents to come out with a new framework for the post-development agenda. So African Union, we had started our consultancy uh, mechanism, a process, and in that process, we came out with a position, which, is, which we call Common Position for Africa, Common African Position for Development, which is CAP 2015. And uh, for the first time, I would say, 
Africa came out with a common position, especially when we talk about development issues. There are a number of occasions when we find some countries, we differ in terms of our, 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 our positions. Some country or some block will have different position and some other block will have different. But for the first time, when we compare the MDGs with this one, we find Africa, we had our own process under the leadership of President of Liberia, and we came out with common position, CAP 2015. And that position has touched into different areas, different sectors. And what was uh, different between this position and the other one, it involved people from, at, from the grassroots. It was not only government, but it was government as well as our own people from the grassroots, different groups, different uh, groups in the societies. They all were involved and they came out with a position. What is different within this uh, position, the previous one? The government were asked what they can do. It didn't come up, it came from the bottom. And this is what we are saying all the time, we need to have a bottom up, bottom up approach. So during this process, the government was asked what you can do, what are your, your, your capability to be able to implement this? Because what was seen during the MDGs, many countries in Africa, if you look at the women, the children, the poverty and others, we have not done very well. The question is there's lack of resources, lack of skills and all other things. So Africans asked, the government were asked, what you can do, what will be your contribution? You start from your contribution, then you ask partners to help you. So the government committed, and we are going to ask government after implement, during the implementation, you committed to provide certain percentage in your budget, why you did not, this is, this is a very uh, good way to bring in accountability to our leaders. So that was CAP 2015, and this is, this year we are continuing to negotiate with the UN, as, and I'm sure by, by September we'll know what is happening in this part of, of uh, development agenda. And again, this year we have also opportunity to look at Beijing plus 20 and uh, the presenters before me, they've talked about it. But I think it's, it's, it's the right time to look at the, how we have fared in implementing the agenda, uh, the Beijing uh, plan for action. How we fare, because sometimes we are seeing a lot of development, but are we satisfied from what we have, we have, we have uh, that time decided to do and what we have accomplished. Are we satisfied? What we can do to be able to move this agenda higher, at a higher level? So again, as I said, this year is, is very interesting for us. We are really excited to also review and come and to link between the decision for Beijing plus 20, also for uh, CAP 2015, as well as Agenda 2063. So that we want to see to what extent all this uh, review and all this uh, planning for the future, how as women, how we can be able to benefit from this and how we can plan ourselves for the future so that we attain a higher level of uh, uh, achievement and of development. Now, uh, in that respect, uh, let me now go to uh, the topic that I was asked to talk about, and this is uh, uh, Agenda 2063. As I said, the 2015, the year of, of women empowerment and development towards Africa, Agenda 20. And Agenda 2063, it's not that we are waiting for the next 50 years for development. It happened in a sense that 2013, we review our our, I mean, we review the whole existence of African Union from OAU to AU. And in that re uh, process of reviewing, our commission decided to, again, not asking the government, and this is what I'm saying, this is a new sort of uh, thinking introduced by our chairperson, saying we have worked with government all these years, and government, they are getting support from the donors, we, 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 we have a lot of things, we've been working together. But we want to know what are the thinking of our people because they are the ones who put us here. We, we, we are governments because the people, our own people have elected us, have asked us, it's like a commitment, it's like a contract. So our own bosses, let, uh, let ask them what they feel. So in that respect, the Agenda 2063, we ask our people what, <coughs> what Africa, they have to tell us what sort of Africa they want. So they came out with the various, I mean, responses. 
And it was, it was like an eye opening for us because sometimes government, we, we, have, we have this tendency as government to think that we know the best, we know our people. What is, the, what is the best for our people? But the people said, no, what you are doing is not right. We want a, a different approach. We want a different Africa. And this time, we will hold you accountable for what we want as Africa. Now, in terms of the theme, uh, the year of women empowerment development, <coughs> what is the undertaking? Well, African Union decided to, to undertake something within these two years, within the, uh, uh, the theme of empowering African women for development and uh, 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 prosperity. One of the things that was committed, <coughs> by our leaders committed, well, number one was to ensure that the women will be able to sit in the table for conflict uh, uh, resolution and peace building. This, was, this is a decision that was taken by the United Nations a long time ago. But how many, many countries are not really, have managed to really implement this decision? And there is, a, there is a resolution on that. But now what we are saying, we have to see that African women really participate actively in the issue of peace and security for, for the continent. We have said by 2020, Africa should silent guns. But if you want to silence guns, you have to involve women because women are the, the we, we are the mostly affected when, when the situation of peace and when the peace is broken and the situation of conflict. So in that respect, now we have we have issues of uh, uh, insecurity for women and children during the conflict, violence during conflict situation, and other things. So I think when African Union decide to and to say that they, are, they want to ensure women participate in this because even when you send peacekeepers, you have to provide contingents for women, because, women contingent, because they are the one who knows what is happening and they are the one who can question women and they are the one who can provide support to women. Another area is uh, increasing representation of women in public, uh, public life. This was also in Beijing. Now we can ask ourselves how many countries in Africa we have managed really pushing women in the public uh, space. There are some good countries, success, can, uh, success stories in some countries, but some countries still they are not talking about, they have not done much. So what we're saying for, during the theme, saying and asking our leaders to make sure and to, to, to find the laws and to abide to those laws, regulation and laws, to enable women to be in public spaces, many of women to participate in, 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 in parliamentary election and uh, other, other sort of uh, uh, processes of uh, election. Between now and the end of 2015, we have 18 elections going to happen in Africa, including my country, Tanzania. So what we can do here as women leaders to support women in these 18 countries, let's start from there so that we can, we can put in those uh, decision-making uh, position, women who can who understand where we came from and also will be part and players in, in, in uh, transforming Africa to where we want. And another, another aspect of uh, uh, the theme for this year, this is in, in terms of economic empowerment and financial inclusion of women. We are seeing women are excluded, excluded in the, in the access to, to, to access uh, capital, to access technology, even in terms of uh, education. Women also, they, because most of the families are poor, so they don't get access to all those things, <laughs> and which is very, very important. Access to market, access to infrastructure, all these things also have been decided to support and to make sure our government provide enough uh, budget to be able to reach, to push women in the, those areas. Again, access to infrastructure, because if you don't have good road, most of the time, if you look at the statistics of a rural economy, you find women are the players. But roads are not good, and they cannot afford to have a, I mean, modern transport because they, are, they don't have that much capital to be able to interact, to be able to take, to be able to exploit the value chain. We also are saying, also women, you have to give them that opportunity. So as I said, uh, 
This was the theme, and I believe we have the role. We have, first of all, we have to know what the theme is for 2015, and, and, uh, and, uh, and it, as I said, it, co it coincides together with the agenda 2063, but also when we review the Be Beijing, uh, we have also to see to what extent we can move forward. Now, what, what, is, uh, what is new? You can say, we can say we have had this story from African Union for all these years, but the, 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 there is, you could see some uh, subtle changes in terms of decision making, in terms of commitment. For, for, the, for, for the last, I mean, let me put it this way. We are seeing a lot of uh, uh, effort to unite the continent. And uh, in that sense, you find in the issue of peace and security, Africa is united. We are sending, our countries are sending uh, troops. It was not that, uh, uh, it was very rare before. We are also addressing health issues. We still have health challenges. When you're addressing health issues, the good example of Ebola and African Union, because when Ebola came initially, we didn't see a lot of our partners coming forward. But African Union, we sent our, 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 our own ex, uh, health expert, and we did a lot, we raised funds and things. We are seeing a lot of difference in terms of our approach towards uh, facing the challenges that the continent is, is having. Even in the issue of uh, uh, the new threat, the new threat means the extremism, radicalism, and all those things where they are using young girls they are using even, I mean, young girls of uh, 10 years to, to, to be the suicide bomber. Those are the issues that really close to my chairperson. And it has all of us, women of Africa, African origin. So to see that we are, our children don't have future because they are being used to be, to, uh, as a tool of, uh, for radicalization and extremism. So African, as I said, we are addressing those issues together. And women have a major role to be able to reduce issues of extremism and radicalism through our tradition, through our education, and other things. Now, uh, brothers and sisters, when we look at the agenda 2023, what are the aspirations? Because I said earlier on that uh, the African people themselves, they told the commission and our leaders that their, their aspiration is in different areas. And I have distributed books. You'll see the agenda, the blueprint I have, I've submitted here, you have distributed here. You'll see there are a number of aspirations that African people want to see that uh, 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 African, our leaders, really develop those aspirations. And as I said, it was, a, it was an inclusive consultant, consultative process between African Union and, uh, and, uh, and our governments and our people. And uh, the, uh, the blueprint was adopted and uh, we are working on it. There are specific uh, projects for that and there are other, other programs that are going to link with, the, with, uh, our, with this agenda. Now, what are the aspirations? The first aspiration was number one is a pros they want to see a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. They want to see an integrated continent politically united based on the ideas of an Africanism and the vision of African Renaissance. They want to see African of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. We have all those charters, human rights charters, and the, the Charter for Human Rights and the Rights for Women. We have all those sexual reproductive, but we want to see implementation of those charters. Some countries still, they are not really implementing the, the charter that we, we have adopted and ratified. And then you have, uh, we want to see a peaceful and secure Africa. They want to see Africa a strong cultural identity, common heritage value and, uh, and ethic. They want to see Africa where development is people driven, unleashing the potential of its women and youth. This is because statistically, Africa, we can see we are almost 51% of our population. By 2050, statistically we are told one quarter of the world population will have young people. And, 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 th and, that, and those young people are from Africa. And if you look at the composition of our population, 51% of those are women. Right now, by 2025, we will be 2 billion 
in terms of population, two billion African population, and 51% of the two billion is Af women. So this, this is a very powerful, very powerful uh, group that can really make a difference in terms of African development. So they realize that there is a potential, now, first of all in numbers, but also if you empower them, they can be able to make a difference, both women and youth. And the last one they want to see strong, united, and influential global players and partners. So Agenda 2063 is a call to action. We are calling governments, civil society, academic, private sector, and other international, continental, regional bodies. Diaspora, like us here with diaspora, and every African, men and women alike. This is a call for action. So because this time we want to introduce, as I said, accountability. We have to ask our, our government in terms of if delivering of their promises. If they don't deliver promises, they have to be accountable. We have our parliamentary, we have our youth bodies. This time, we are trying to empower our youth body, empower civil society to be able to enhance accountability to our government. And uh, so what is the, pla uh, the place of the African women in the African 2063 agenda? And this is the question that we are all asking our, both the, uh, ourselves in the African Union, but also outside the African Union. Yes, we are seeing Africa rising, and there is a promise of Africa reaching the, the mountain top. But what is the role of, of women? What are, we, what are we going to benefit from this? We have, we have had 50, 50 years of our independence, 50 years of our African Union, but we, we have we have something to, to, to be proud of, but we need to see more. We want to have to, to transform Africa. But when you transform Africa, but you also have to see the changes. You have to see development. Women have to see that. They, they have to enjoy the cake of development. So because of that, we, we categorize in different categories. For instance, I'll, I'll just give an example of one of the questions that uh, uh, people said, especially women, saying, we are tired of using hand hole. We want to uh, modernize agriculture. Because majority of pers well, agri people in, the sec in this sector are women. But we are using, I mean, primitive tools. We want to modernize. We want to use technology in agriculture. We want to be tied to the value chain. We want to process our uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, produce. We want to, to, to enter international markets. Because we are, we, we are producing coffee, we are producing cocoa, but at the end of the day, we are buying chocolate from outside. We want to be part of this process and so many other areas. So we, African, African women and youth, as they say, they want to, uh, to be the players or drivers of the transformation, drivers of this change. And uh, so another question, women leaders. What we can do as women leaders in seeing that all this commitment, all this uh, sort of uh, uh, agenda that our leaders are bringing up for, for our development. But I think the leaders, women leaders have the role to play in this. And what are, what are the, our role? What are the role of women leaders? Number one is, will be in terms of monitoring in terms of evaluating. I'm saying this because there was a time we were all talking about gender budgeting. The question we should ask our government, in, in your plans, how much budget are you all allocating for program or project that would benefit women? So when we, when we say that there is a role for leaders, we start from the parliamentarian to civil societies to other groups in, uh, in, in, in different level. We have important role, even our self-activists, we have important role to question our government. And this time not only question, but also making our government accountable. We are the one who are electing our governments. We are the one who elect our parliamentarians and uh, we are elected our, our, our leaders in, in, at the grassroots level. But we don't challenge them, we don't punish them, we don't make them accountable. So our, one of our major role will be to focus in implementation and to see all those resolution, declaration, charters, we have all these type of uh, uh, decisions in, within the African Union and our government. Some government, they have not even up to now domesticated some of the declarations, domesticated some of the resolution. Because once you have a resolution, you must make that resolution into a law. 
we still have not done, some countries have not ratified some of the resolutions, some countries have not transformed those resolutions into laws. So we have that responsibility. We have to continue to engage our government. We have to continue to activate, we have to, to train our people, we have to sensitize our people to know what is their right. In the issue of human rights, we have to inform our people that the human right is the basic right for them. And African Union have also included the right for women, the right for children. So we have to, to educate our people in terms of what is happening so that we can make our government accountable. Because as I said, African Union is a consensus organization. It comes out of the continental law, but still we have the rule, we have, we have the uh, responsibility to make sure our government are implementing all the things. And, uh, and the last thing I wanted to say in terms of uh, the overall uh, uh, role for us, to work together with our partners, international partners, they have been helping us for a lot. But at the same time, we have to focus in a specific area to see that there's a, uh, there's a leap forward. I'll give you the last example in terms of empowerment. Our we time is getting short, madam. Yeah, I'd yeah. love you to finish. Yeah. The last one, I would like to thank you for, for, for this opportunity. And as I said, we all have responsibility after this meeting to really go back to our countries and start to work, start to learn, to know of what's happening, and to start really asking questions that are necessary, needed for specific areas. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've laid it out for us in many different ways. Our, our Professor Mina Mama is listening and will help us process. So I won't do anything beyond that later on. She'll help us to process this. We're coming at a good time. I'm trying to make sure that we keep time because that's a good thing for us to keep time and be on time. And we are coming at an exciting moment where we want to begin to also understand where we are coming from, where we are situated. We've been actually given a context to work on. So I'm gonna take some liberty and do something that I think really needs to be done that isn't even there on the timetable, but I think we have a few minutes to do it. I'm going, I, want, I just want everybody to have a feel of who is here. So I'm just gonna ask each one of you to simply say your name and what you represent, no more than that because we still have a couple of other speakers that I want to introduce to you that you would really like to hear from. So let's uh, just begin from that corner. Just really loud, say your name and where you come from so everybody feels good about the context. Wonderful, next. Great. We could hold the claps until the end yeah. so that we hear each other. Okay. Okay. My name is Adema Sangale. I'm a Mason Fellow at the Harvard. My name is Adema Sangale. I'm a Mason Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I'm from Kenya. Great. Makale Kamara from Guinea, Women Ministers and Parliamentarian Network, Secretary General. Great. Amina Mama, I'm from Nigeria, currently here at the University of California. Good. Margot Okazawa-Ray from Berkeley, California. I'm a mild-mannered school teacher. Um, Julia Akur from Southern Sudan with the South Sudan Women Lawyers Association. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Talent Jumo from Zimbabwe. I'm with Katsu Sisterhood. Uh, good morning. My name is Maggie Chikozi from Uganda. I am with Akina Mama of Africa, but I'm also an entrepreneur. My name is Dr. Sylvia Olainka Blyden. I am from Sierra Leone. I'm here in my capacity as a media consultant, but I'm also a politician and a women's rights activist. Hi, my name is Miriam and I'm from Northeastern. From where? I did. 
and Northeastern University. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Cynthia Liu. I'm from Los Angeles, and I run an education news website called K-12 News Network. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Funke Michaels. I'm a Mason Fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I am Nigerian and Kenyan. My husband's Kenyan. So thank you for coming. Good choice. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maria. I'm ha very happy to be here. I'm a community health worker. Hi, everyone. My name is Marshall Bizure. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm a Mason Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. I've been working in human rights and uh, girl child education in Burundi and Zimbabwe. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Wu. I am from New York City. Uh, I am here uh, from the New York Times. I work in the technology group. Hello, everyone. My name is Emanuela Azo from Nigeria. I work with a non-governmental organization, Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Patricia Donnelly. I'm a teacher at the University of Medjugorje, but I also coordinate an NGO called Gender Equality Peace and Development Center, and I chair the board of a West African Network for Peace Building Nigeria and Action Aid Nigeria. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosemary Okello Lale from Ford Foundation, based in Kenya, but I'm here with my son, who is uh, being inducted into the women's world. And <laughs> He's uh, Biko Olali, just finished master's. Just let him say his <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Biko Olali. Uh, I'm her son, and I'm here uh, in my own capacity <laughs> to be inducted into the women's world. Yeah, thanks. Rick, you're welcome. welcome. Good morning. My name is Monday Muyangwa. I'm the Africa Program Director at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Betsy Hoodie and I work with Wellspring Advisors in New York City. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Hello and good morning everybody. My name is Mark Kamara Bangoa and I'm here to support uh, my mom, Makali Kamara. Hi everyone. Yeah. My name is Masin Joroge. I'm from Kenya and I'm a journalist by profession. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Veneclausen, and I'm the director of Jazz Just Associates. Great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Winnie Manyara uh, from Kenya, the financial sector. I represent women strongly in the financial sector. I'll talk to you later. Good <laughs> <laughs> morning, everyone. Yeah, money, money, money. I'm Yvette Kathirima from Femnet, based in Kenya. Good morning, everyone. I'm Geraldine Fraser Moleketi. I'm the special envoy on gender of the African Development Bank. I'll also speak with you later. I'm South African by birth. Thank you. Morning. I'm Jane Godia from African Woman and Child. I'm from Kenya. Good morning, my name is Ruth Ojambo Cheng. I'm the executive director of Women's International Cross-Cultural Exchange. In short, ISIS Wiki, but not the ISIS you know. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Susan Kihara. I work with the Ford Foundation in Nairobi office, and we're glad to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha McKenzie. Um, I'm Kenyan. I run a storytelling website called marriedaddy.co. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shunaz Ali from Ads and Action Fund Africa, and I'm happy you're all here. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Carey, and I've communicated with most of you. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to meet you in person. And I had the grant making program at Argent Action Fund Africa. You're a dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, I am Busaina Kamel from Egypt. 
Uh, I am a TV uh, news uh, anchor, and I am the first female presidential candidate, and uh, I am very happy to be with you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse. I'm from Malawi, member of parliament. I think uh, after the introduction that just came, it's very hard to beat that. <laughs> but otherwise, I'm very glad to meet all of you. I think I must be the only Malawian here, so makes me feel special. <laughs> Thank you for your new law on, on child marriage. Yeah. We like it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rudo Chigudu, artist and activist from Zimbabwe. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Grace Bogwa from Women's Empowerment Link in Kenya. And I think um, it's rubbing in. I need my son to be here in the next meeting <laughs> at this rate. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Farai Gundan. I am based in New York City, but originally from Zimbabwe. I actually write for Forbes, Forbes Africa, and Forbes Women. And it's a privilege to write about each and every one of you. I am amongst greatness, and I really thank you so much. I know I'm taking up <laughs> my time as a journalist, but really, um, it's a privilege to write about you um, and your, the work that you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Colleen Lomona from Gender Links, which is a Southern African organization based in Johannesburg. My roots are originally Zimbabwean, and I have strong links with West Africa through 30 years of marriage to a Ghanaian. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and esteemed panel. Thank you so much. My name is Eileen Alma, and I'm the, from the International Center for Women's Leadership at Cody Institute in Canada. I'm Canadian by birth and Ethiopian by marriage. Very nice to see you all. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, there's just one more person I need to give the mic to. Thank you. My name is Dana El Hassan, and uh, I work at the African Development Bank with the Special Envoy on Gender in Abidjan. Thank you. That's everybody. And I am from Sudan, and uh, I'm a gender and fragility expert. Wonderful. And That's good morning, everyone. My name is Grace Chirenje. I'm from Zimbabwe Young Women's Network for Peace Building. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this this was for of Professor Osman, because she said that she'll be teaching, you'll be going in and out, and I didn't want you to leave this room without knowing who your guests are, so I wanted to do this for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you get it? Okay. Professor Osman, Thank you so much. this was for you so that when, if you have to leave and go to teach, you will know who you are hosting. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for that. I, 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 I told you that my name is Musimbi, I'm the CEO for the Global Fund for Women, which has funded many, many people who are part of this place and a partner of uh, Argent Action Fund in being one of the women's funds that really care for the women's human rights. And um, I was at this university some years back studying Hebrew. So uh, it's, my, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's good to come back. And I wanna, um, I wanna bring to you one of the, the, the big questions that Argent Action Fund wants us to reflect on is what has changed since Beijing. And so before we can say what has changed f since Beijing, you have to think in your mind, where were you? Where were you in 1995? Were you in that rain or not? And so to get us just our appetite whetted, we're gonna hear from two people tell us about where were they in 1995? Rudo and Comba are our stars for this session. And after they speak to us, I think we are gonna take a little break and then we'll come back and get going even deeper in the agenda that has been open for us. So Rudo, can we have you? Rudo, I think I saw you there. Now I know where, <laughs> and I saw Comba there. That was, so, that now I know where everybody is. Yes, okay. Where were you? Okay, I was completely <laughs> taken off guard, that's for sure. 
Um, Beijing, I was a little in my first decade of living. Um, and possibly what I remember most um, about Beijing isn't the experience of being at Beijing, but hearing um, the excitement and the energy that took place around Beijing. Um, I remember distinctly watching the news on television and a very strong and assertive woman um, in, in our parliament at that time speaking um, on the news and my father turning around and saying, well, there they go, those Beijings. <laughs> in, in the most like denigrating kind of way. And I remember just thinking to myself, she seemed so confident and assertive and it made me want to be a Beijing too, even though I didn't really understand um, what that meant. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty much my experience um, um, with Beijing, just hearing about the energy and desiring to be one of those bad, bad, bad women that were in Beijing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. And what um, Kumba is going to do for us is do this in spoken word. Give us an inspiration through spoken word, and then we're going to take a break. Is that right? Okay, Kumba, welcome. Thank you. I'd like everyone to get up. Let's start, let's, let's do this. You can let things, you know, you'll need your hands. Yeah. I'll need mine too. Let's do this. Fund Africa, as the Ashoka Empathy Initiative representative, as an artist, a writer, and I want to greet and thank each of you. And I will start by celebrating today. I just you want, you want the mic? Okay, I'll, I'll do the mic. Um, I was saying that I wanted to celebrate every woman 
uh, that has ever lived, that has ever taken breath on this earth. Starting with my own mother, my grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, going all the way down to the first women that ever gave birth on this earth. And I would like to say that um, it's beautiful to be here. Thank you, Dan. Um, I know that if you are here, you have a story that the knowledge from the real story of your life, if it was really told and if it was really out, it could really bring light that would help us find the real path to humanity. I was asked by Ndana to make a spoken word, something around the African moment. And she said, I didn't, I shouldn't bore you. I have to do it in a way that would be exciting. And I started writing a poem, but it didn't quite work out <laughs> somehow. So I decided I'll just make a little conversation about this moment and it would be a conversation with Mama Africa. So, in one of my languages, Wolof, when people say Nangadef, the response is Mangifi. Mangifi means, I am here. You ask people, how are you? They say, I'm here. <laughs> so, I will ask you, Every time I say, Mama Africa, how are you? I'd like you to respond, I'm here. And I need to hear your voice to help me speak, because this is a conversation, okay? Mm. Greeting, Mama Africa, how are you? I'm here. How are your people? Oh, they're fine. They have no sorrows, I mean, there are women, men, young women, children, rising up, demanding justice, fighting to speak for themselves. <laughs> because, you know, this is my people's turn to raise, to rise up uh, in this time. Yes, my people are reading, learning, leading, growing, working. It's going fast. They're hard to catch up with. And it's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. My people are relearning to love who they are, growing a new sense of identity, celebrating their diversity, their language, their songs, their fabric, their hair, their skin, their literature, their values. My people are today their own philanthropic healers, leaders, lovers, guide. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. How are your children? Oh, they're doing fine. They are growing in all of the senses of the world, in numbers, in strength, in knowledge, growing faster than I can realize. I mean, they could do better. Too many are still being hurt, and some are hurting each other, especially my girl children. I'm still losing too many of them from curable disease, from malnutrition, from preventable accident. I'm losing too many of them to violence, also from the violence of poverty to the violence of the lack of opportunity and hope. But I'm celebrating every one of their successes. I, they are connected to my nerves. I know their names. They are my children, remember? Each one of them, their lives matters to me. I'm growing new hands to touch them and to give them the love, the embrace that they need. My children are growing into an alert, younger generation, increasingly demanding for better governance and accountability, new forms of leadership. I'm witnessing my youth rising, and I shiver when the danger lurks towards them. Greetings, Mama Africa. How are you? I'm here. How are your women? Oh, the women, they're doing great. 
They are beautiful, powerful, feminist, artists, activists, change makers, resilient, creative, creating new path. I mean, they are still suffering in their home or in their workplace, in the hands of family or strangers, in the dungeon of, in the threats of religious fundamentalism, in the arms of dealers, in the injustice of an economy that is only for a few to have more and more every day. My women are struggling. They are having to compete with the biggest investors, even in the smallest rural areas. They are giving, but they are giving birth every day to new ways, to new world. My young women <laughs> who are taking over technology spaces, they are developers of technology that benefit women and their communities. They are changing the meaning of leadership so everyone can be a change maker, have opportunity and capacity to make change happen, push in order to achieve revolutionary change. How are you, Mama Africa? How are your men? <laughs> they're fine, they're handsome, they're strong. I mean, they're also struggling. <laughs> they are not exempt from the preventable disease. They are not exempt from the violence. They're quickly losing so many privileges, traditional ones, modern ones, without being worn. Some of them are getting restless, angry, deranged by it. The smart ones are catching up to catch to accept women being powerful and children smarter than their parents. They are coming back from immigration as European country declaring bankruptcy. They, are being, they have been sending money, more money than the AIDS, and they are reorganizing philanthropy. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. How are your rivers, your lands, your forests, your animals? <laughs> They're fine. They're doing good, still abandoned. There is enough sun, <laughs> enough wind for all of us. I mean, but <laughs> we are losing a lot every day for less clear cuts. Um, just to be burned for basic energy, animals disappearing, and the exploitation of the land that follow a trend that we know hasn't worked for others. The land is saying it makes no sense to waste so much of our natural resources. They're calling women and children to be their advocate. We know that there are other ways. Huh, my lands, they're still struggling. Um, it has been so long um, that so many are leeched on them, sucked for centuries since colonization and today cooperation. The flows of riches in the world are still going the other side. And I live with open veins, and it's my blood that fills still the Occident. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. How are your institutions? <laughs> They're fine, growing stronger with time, adapting to realize their full potential. I mean, they're still recovering from the confusion and the profound destruction from the schizophrenia of past and present, tradition and modern frameworks. Yes, we have some weak governance in institution, including in the women's movement, in the leadership, in the management styles. How are you, Mama Africa? Um, yeah. Mm, I can't hear your voice. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. How are your leaders? They're fine. I mean, <laughs> I mean. They struggle to choose between just taking their cut and um, in the exploitation of my people or dying are martyrs in the hand of corporate bandit and the government disguise. Some are working to join new forms of leadership, multi-headed, hard to destroy and to weaken so that when it would be all done, people will say, we did it ourselves. My leaders are challenged. <laughs> by the rising of fundamentalism, extremism, conflict, persistent traditional cultural practices and unfair intervention by external powers. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. Yeah. How are your friends, your helpers, your partners? Oh, they're good. <laughs> they're doing great. I mean, they often miss the point. Um, they say they help us while you know, they help themselves. <laughs> Overseas development assistance have been used uh, to further colonial agenda 
but some are fighting to change uh, how um, this all goes, how this development system is negotiated. I don't want to get into all the details, you know, of <laughs> understanding all this, but yeah, they're fine. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. Oh, I'm here. I have no sorrow. I mean, <laughs> on my mind, six centuries of slavery, you know, um, colonial rules that include forced labor and violence, still I have a hard time remembering who I am. Yes, uh, what do I do with myself after so much rape <laughs> and continuing again in legal forms, in commerce? Um, my body carries all the scares and still many of my cut are still bleeding and it's hard to heal when the hurts are often reopened, even sometimes by people who are trying to just be helpful. Huh. But I'm doing fine. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. I am here. I'm doing fine because I can see um, butterflies. Can you see butterflies? I see so many butterflies like you, um, colors and movement in this moment. Butterflies flying around in old beauty, so many butterflies like you. My eyes are hurting, um, and so many more to come out. So many butterflies in gestation, um, in so many in the process of metamorphosis, living in fragility. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. I'm fine. I have no sorrow. I'm just yearning um, for a humanity where black and colored people are human, where women are human, where poor people are human. I'm yearning for love. How are you, Mama Africa? I'm here. I'm yearning for tenderness, for respect, for simplicity and generosity. I'm fine. 